I'm going to be in 1 Samuel, and we're going to talk about how to become a giant slayer. But before we get into that, I just want to tell you a little bit about this book. It's got 31 chapters, 810 verses, and 25,061 words, or around that. The book of 1 Samuel is a transition book that goes from the time of the judges to a time of kings and prophets. 1 Samuel is one of the six books in the Old Testament that deal with kings and kingdoms. There are three main characters in the book of 1 Samuel, and those three characters are Samuel, Saul, and David. And honorable mentions could be Hannah, Eli, Jonathan, and Michael. So how to become a giant slayer. The first way, lend yourself to the Lord. In chapter 1, you find the birth of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and his mother Hannah prayed for him. It says in 1 Samuel 1, 27 through 28, Hannah says, For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he, shall, and he worship the Lord there. Now maybe you didn't have a mother like Hannah who prayed over you, but this doesn't matter. Don't use your parents or your family as an excuse. You can still lend yourself to the Lord. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Most Christians today have lent themselves to everything but the Lord. If you're going to face the giants of this life, then lending yourself to the flesh, the world, and the devil isn't going to make you stronger. When the giant comes, you're just going to be weaker. You're going to be more likely to just serve the giant. But Hannah said, as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. This means once you start, you go until you die. And as long as you live, you need to give yourself to God. It's a daily process of getting up in the morning and hitting the start button and going. That's how you finish your course. You just get up every morning, hit the start button, and keep going. And if you do that till you die, then you finish your course. Now, chapter 2, don't be held back by an evil influence. An evil influence will hold you back from getting stronger and growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Samuel was brought up in the temple under the priest Eli. Now, Eli had wicked sons, and they were born to be wild. They were hell raisers. They were w very wicked men. And the Bible even calls them sons of Belial. In 1 Samuel 2, 12 through 13, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord, and the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servants came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. You see that flesh hook with three teeth in his hand? That is where you get the idea that Satan has a pitchfork. Because his boys here have a flesh hook with three prongs, that they were using while the flesh was in seething. In 1 Samuel 2, 14 through 16, And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself, so they didn't shallow unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give us, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. So they were hard on the people, and made them resent giving to the Lord. They would take it by force. So it says, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Uh, men like Eli's sons being in charge can make people abhor the things of God. Even though Samuel, though, had wicked, older, evil influence in his life, he ministered before the Lord, being a child. It said in 1 Samuel 2.18, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. So it's always amazing when you have a young kid who's more right with God than the older people here. 
he's much more right with God than these two sons of Belial, as it calls them. You may have an evil mother and father. You may have wicked older brothers and sisters. But this shouldn't hold you back on your path to being a giant slayer. Your friends shouldn't hold you back. You shouldn't have an evil influence that has so much control on you. Eli's sons are not giant slayers. They end up slew themselves. Now in chapter 3, the Lord calls Samuel. And he doesn't let his words fall to the ground. In 1 Samuel 3.10, And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Then it says in 1 Samuel 3.19, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. If you don't let the Lord's words fall, then your words will be effective. Bible believers have power in their words because they can speak with authority. God spoke to Samuel, and he didn't let his words fall to the ground. We know that God has perfect words in the King James Bible, and we can use them and speak with confidence. When somebody attacks the word, I always take the Bible side in the controversy. You can't fight the giants if you lack confidence in the words. And what happens if you start using the new versions? You start believing, well, there must be errors because there's so many different translations and there must be errors in it is what you'll say. And you'll lose confidence in the words. And you're going to have to have confidence in the words to fight the giant and let not the words fall to the ground. Chapter 4, you got the Philistines taking the ark. Now don't forget that this world can't take anything from you. The Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant in chapter 4. And it causes Eli to fall backwards and he breaks his neck and he dies because he was an old and fat man, it said. And the difference between us and them back then is that we don't have something physical like this. What I have with the Lord is spiritual and nobody can take it from me. They can't take my Bible, but I have it hidden in my heart. They can take it, but I have it hidden in my heart. They can kill my body, but it's what's inside me that's saved. I don't have the Ark of the Covenant to worry about. If you think about it, this world can't take anything from me except what they put on me already. They can take your family, but you'll see them again one day if you're saved. And when you go to face the giant, you have to remember that. All he can take away from you is what the world has already put on you. But they can't take away what God has put in you. The Philistines, Philistines can take the ark, but they can't take your salvation. They can't take your, your Bible if you've put it in your heart. They can't take your soul. Chapter 5, the hand of God is against the Philistines for taking the ark. So this should remind you that even though the enemies are coming against you and they're beating you up, don't forget that God will recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. In 1 Samuel 5, 9, And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. So they're smote by the Lord for this. And 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. God may raise up an enemy against you, but he'll get them back for touching you. And in chapter 6, the Philistines send the ark back. He smote them so bad that the Philistines got hammered by the Lord for taking the ark so bad that they decide to send it back. This is an example of comedy in the Bible. It's just a funny story. If God... Now, look at how they send it back. In 1 Samuel 6, 7 through 12, it says, Now therefore make a new cart, and take two milk kine, so two cows, in which there hath come no yoke, and tie the kine to the cart, and bring their calves home from them, and take the ark of the Lord, and lay it upon the cart, and put the jewels of gold which you returned from a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away that it may go, and see if it goeth by up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, that he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us, and the men did so, and took two milk kine, and tied them to the cart, and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of their emeralds. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh, and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Beth Shemesh. 
So God guided these two cows and they went in the right direction. If God can guide two cows, then he can guide you and put you in the right direction. I mean, he can use you a lot better than he could use a cow, probably. Surely. Just let God guide you. If you're going to be a, a giant slayer, you have to let God guide you. You can be better than these two cows here. God uses animals in the Bible. Remember what he said to Peter before the cock crowed thrice? God used that, that, that animal. Remember what he did with, with uh, Balaam's ass. He, he had it speak to Balaam. You know, God uses animals in the scriptures. If God can use an animal, he can use you. Chapter 7, Samuel judges Israel. And if you're going to be a giant slayer, you have to listen to the preacher. Look what Samuel said in 1 Samuel 7, 3. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtoreth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So get rid of the gods that have completely conquered your life. That's what the preacher's telling you. Whether that be Fortnite or cigarettes or alcohol or drugs or sex and all these things that you're going to for help instead of coming to the Lord for help. If you want to be completely prepared to face a giant, then you don't need anything the Lord doesn't approve of in your life. Imagine that if that giant showed up tomorrow. Are you going to have to pray to get right before you can even call on him for help? Chapter 8, Israel demands a king. Make sure God is on the throne of your heart. Israel demands a king. God wasn't on the throne of their heart. In 1 Samuel 8, 6 through 7, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Israel wanted a man to fight their battles for them instead of relying on the Lord himself. Make sure God is on the throne of your heart. Psalm 20 and verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. There is always someone bigger, meaner, stronger, tougher, and smarter than you, but there is never anyone that can outdo God. For most people, they are on the throne of their own heart, and it's written all over their face. It's in their actions. Make God the king of your heart. And don't demand another king. Don't put yourself as king. Chapter 9 through 10. Saul is chosen and anointed and proclaimed as king. You know, he starts out good, but he ends up bad. And this shows God will give you what you want. Saul was the people's choice. He wasn't God's choice. You need to make sure what you want is what God wants. It says in 1 Samuel 9, 2, that from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. What looks good for you may not be good for you. Saul was the people's choice. He pictures the Antichrist who will also be the people's choice. God will give the people what they want, but what they need is Jesus Christ. Chapter 11, don't make a covenant with the world or wicked men. If you're going to be a real giant slayer, then don't team up with a, a giant. It says in 1 Samuel 11, 1 through 2, Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes, and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. So he wants them to thrust out all their right eyes. That's just like the Antichrist in Zechariah eleven seventeen, who's got his right eye darkened. That's why you see all the one-eye symbolism, as I just showed you if you watched that video exposing the Fortnite stuff. You see, this world wants to make a covenant with you. And throughout life, you will be faced with choices of making agreements with wicked men to prosper. Even as a kid in school, a kid might say, uh, throw, this, throw this toy at the teacher and you can join my club. But it gets worse later. In high school, they say, drink this beer and we can be friends. In gangs, they say, cut someone's face in the crowd and you can join our gang. It continuously gets worse as you go along. Remember your agreements with God 
and stay away from covenants with wicked men. If you want to be a giant slayer, don't go join up with the giant. Chapter 12, follow the good and right way. In 1 Samuel 12, 23 through 25, Moreover, ask for me, God forbid, that I should sin against the Lord in seizing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. Follow the good and the right way. There are less giants on that road. The way of the transgressor is hard. But on the good and right way, you fear the Lord. And Samuel says, only fear the Lord. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Even if it's fearing a really big man, like a giant, it's still a snare. Samuel said, if you, if you do wickedly, you shall be consumed. And when you stray off the good and right way, you run into trouble. Walking the way of a transgressor would be like a child walking along in a neighborhood full of serial killers. It would be like a dog swimming in a pool full of sharks. You're going to get hurt. Now, chapter 13. If you're going to be a giant slayer, your sword, you can't leave it at home. Don't leave home without it. In 1 Samuel 13, 19 through 22... It says, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, and his coulter, and his axe, and his mattock. Yet they had a fall for the mattocks, and for the coulters, and for the forks, and for the axes, and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan his son, was there found. Now Saul pictures a pastor who knows the Bible, but doesn't give the Bible to his people. He lets them stay without a sword. Some pastors may say, well, they might get bored if I just teach them the Bible, or if I just just stay teaching them the Bible all the time. I gotta, I gotta have these really good flashy sermons that really get them interested in the scriptures. Now the pastor knows the Bible for himself, but he's refusing to teach the book because he thinks people won't come to hear him or something. They're going to get bored and because people think the Bible's boring. So he just gives them these sermons that just is like candy all the time. So he has a sword and they don't. Kind of like Saul has a sword, but the people don't. He's not getting them prepared. If your pastor won't teach you the sword, then get some preaching and teaching tapes, and learn it on your own with the help of the Holy Ghost, of course. And this way you're not walking out to face the giant without a two-edged sword in your hand. You're going to have to learn how to use your weapon. And then don't leave it at home. Take it with you to work. Take it with you everywhere. You're going to have to take your Bible with you. It's going to have to constantly be with you. Take it with you to every room. That way you can read it instead of doing stupid stuff. Now, chapter 14. Wicked men will use your strengths. You got to remember this. In 1 Samuel fourteen fifty two, And there was sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or valiant man, he took him unto him. Saul was a wicked man, but he was in the Lord's army. But he was a wicked man. And he picked out all the strong and valiant men. The world and the devil will use you for your strengths and talents. God will use a weak man because he gets the glory when the weak man wins. But the devil loves to get the strong men with talent because they take the glory from God a lot of times. That is why Hollywood's so devilish. He finds talent so that he can use them to get worship indirectly because people worship the, the flesh of those men with all that talent. You need to remember that if you've got talent, that the devil, he'll... He'll try to come after you and get you to use your talent for him. Just like Saul, anytime he saw any strong man or valiant man, he took him unto him. You got to remember that you're going to slay the giant, not to team up with a giant. Now, the next thing, chapters 15 and 16, you're going to see that God uses little men. In 1 Samuel 15, 17, and Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, which thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. Now Saul was a big man, 
but before he was right when he was anointed king, he was little in his own sight. You might be a big guy, but you need to be little in your own sight. Samuel says to Saul, When thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head? God wants little men. Even if you're a big guy, be a little guy in your mind. First Samuel sixteen seven. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So God's looking on the heart. Are you a little man in the heart? If you go to face the giant thinking you're a giant when you're really just a grasshopper, then he's probably just going to stomp you like one. You have to go to the giant knowing you're just a grasshopper, but not afraid because you're just a grasshopper resting on God's shoulder, and therefore you're looking down at the giant. And God's going to be the one that takes care of the giant. He just makes it look like it was you, but then wants you to give him the glory. See, that's the test. Uh, the, the God will let you uh, slay the giant using his power, and then he'll test you to see if you're going to give him the glory, because to everybody else it looked like you killed the giant. So you got to give God the glory. That's a test. And if you'll do that, then you'll have even more power when you go against the next giant. Now, chapter 17, you have to face the giant. If you're going to be a giant slayer, you got to face him. In 1 Samuel 17, 16, it said in the Philistine, which is the giant, Goliath drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Now, here's David in 1 Samuel 17, 20. And David rose up early in the morning. He rose up early in the morning. You'll never face the giant laying in bed all day long. And it says, And left the sheep with the keeper, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. And it says in 1 Samuel 17, 33 and 34, and Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and a man of war from his youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. So if David is seeing himself as a servant, and that's what he's referring to himself as. And if you don't see yourself as a servant, you're not going to face the giant properly. In 1 Samuel 17, 35 through 37, David says, And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion, and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine, shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear, he would deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine, and Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Notice that David gives credit to the Lord for delivering him out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. That's key. He's letting, he gave David power to slay the lion and the bear and the giant. But the test for David was, was he going to give the glory to God for letting him deliver, for, for letting him slay all those things? You see, that's the test. In 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 40, And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail, and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. I heard Matt Crane say one time to get five smooth stones for every false cult and heresy. And if you've got five good verses that you got memorized in your mind, you can defeat each one and you'll be all right. I think that's good advice. Now, David goes on to defeat the giant. You know, he takes that sling and that rock. The Lord puts that rock right in the giant's forehead, knocks him out. David goes over, cuts his head off. David rose up early in the morning and he faced the giant. You got to face the giant. In chapter 18 through 31, you're going to see with David in his life that you'll have, you will have friends 
after you slay the giant, and you're going to have enemies after you kill the giant. You're going to see that Jonathan is loved David as his own soul, and you're going to see that Saul envied David the rest of his life and tried to kill him the rest of his life, and even gave Michael, Saul gave Michael his daughter to David to be a snare unto him, and she was a snare unto him. And the rest of the book deals with this fight, David versus Saul. You're going to find that once you start slaying giants, the devil is going to use people to go against you and to bring you down. So that the next time you will go against a giant, you'll be more likely to fail. And David has trouble in his life for the rest of his life, just like we will. And that's what you have there in chapter 21. I'll go ahead and tell you what the rest of the book's about in chapter 21, David. You got the, the story about David and the holy bread. David flees to Gath. David pretends to be crazy. In chapter 22, you got David at the cave. And Saul has the priest killed. Chapter 23, David saves the, saves the city of Keilah. And Saul pursues David. In chapter 24, David has a, a chance to kill Saul, but he spares his life because he's not going to touch the Lord's anointed. Chapter 25, you got the death of Samuel, and you got the story about David and Abigail. Chapter 26, you got David spares Saul's life again because he don't want to touch the Lord's anointed. Chapter 27, you got David lives with the Philistines. 28, Saul visits the witch of Endor and commits that horrible sin of doing that where he tells her to bring him up, Samuel. In chapter 31, you got the death of Saul and his sons. And out of all the characters, Jonathan, Saul, Samuel, and David, David is the only one still alive at the end of the book, out of all those characters. But it's an amazing book, a very overlooked book. But you need to be a giant slayer. Take the advice of this book and become one.